Hopefully I'm going to run through some things about uh, graph theory today, some you may know, hopefully there's at least some that you don't. Uh, before I go into the large amounts of detail, I just want to give you a brief introduction to who I am. I'm David, I am a tech lead, a developer um, at a company called Softwire. Uh, we specialise in taking a project, running it end-to-end, -end, but I'm not really here today to talk about that. I'm not really here to talk about my too heavily about my uh, software life. I'm more here to talk about my previous life as a statistician. So back when I was at university, I studied graphs, graph theory quite extensively. Um, and because of that, when I entered the software world, and when I started looking at data in the software world, I noticed it was a thing that people got wrong the most often. When I see data being used on a software system on a day-to-day -day basis, it is very rarely done in the way that the data wants to be used, and the way that the data wants to be manipulated. And so because of that, I think we've got a duty as a developer, and hopefully you agree with me, because you're all here, to actually do data in a more kind of correct manner. I think doing data right has two aspects of it, two aspects to it. First of all, we need to choose the right database. Um, a lot of people will be talking to you today about use cases for Neo4j, and hopefully you agree that Neo4j is usable in a lot of applications. But I want to talk about the other side of it, which is once we've decided we're using Neo4j and once we've decided we're using graph databases, to use Neo4j in a kind of idiomatic way, to utilize a lot of the power that the academic graph theory that has been studied over the last, last few centuries will be able to provide us. SQL has uh, been around for 40 years now, and because of that, we're being able to utilize a lot of the set-based approaches that academics have studied, and I want to do the same for graph theory. So today, it's going to be a relatively theoretical talk, so apologies for that. I'm going to try and touch on a large amount of use cases and sample use cases, and some of the implementation details we might be able to see. But as a reward for sitting through all of that theory, I do want to uh, answer a question for you, which is, what shape is the internet? So hopefully, if you persevere throughout the whole talk, you'll be able to uh, answer that by the end of today. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I just want to very briefly uh, cover what is a graph and the kind of languages I'll be using. Um, so, this is a graph. Uh, this is taken from Jim Webber's Doctor Who data set, so one of the main data sets that are on the NEO website. Um, and this is kind of how we all think about it. We always think about it in pictorial form. But when we start talking about it in a mathematical sense, this is what we're talking about. This is going to be the most mathematical slide in the presentation today, so don't worry. Um, what we mean by this is that a graph is made up of two parts, V and E. The V is the vertex set, which we define as a set of <laughs> n items. There's some number of items floating out there in the world. And in the, uh, in the graphs that we saw, these are just the dots, the ones that we've been talking about before. And the E is the edge set. That is, the pairs. That it's made up of pairs of elements. Um, different, uh, different definitions of graphs define what the edge set is in slightly different ways. For the benefit of a talk on Neo, their edges have to be ordered. That is, they go from one place to another and they're not necessarily distinct. So different nodes can have multiple edges connecting them. So as we saw in the uh, original data set, this is, uh, these are the edges. They're connecting the nodes. This is a very useful definition in a mathematical sense, potentially less so when you start looking at real world examples. And so that's when we start looking at graphical modeling. And when we talk about graphical modeling, what we really mean is taking the V and the E, that is the two parts of a graph that we know about, and giving them real world meanings. So the vertex set, will be, represent some manner of thing, and the edge sets will represent relationships between them. The canonical example, the original example, is the bridges of Königsberg, where we have got uh, bits of land and bridges connecting them. And the things that we really care about are the bits of land. And the, we want to know about the relationships between them, so their edges connecting them. And this is our first bit of graphical modeling. This was the first graphical model that was made. Uh, back in 1735, if I remember correctly, and since then, academic graph theory has sprung. There's more modern use cases, so today is um, general election in the UK, as we mentioned a few times. Please vote if you haven't already. Um, and because of that, we know that, yeah, I know that last night there was a uh, talk on, uh, sorry, a hack about election data, and election data is also very useful, very good modeling a graph, mainly because we don't really care about politicians. We don't care about them as things or blobs. We care about them because of the context of all of the other data surrounding them and because of the relationships between them. We don't care about David Cameron. 
we, we care about David Cameron because he was, uh, won the election in 2010. We care about him because he is the leader of the Conservative Party and because he, you know, he stood in a particular constituency. But the real data here is in the relationships. And there we go. Again, we can kind of see by taking our graphical model that we're putting certain information against the V. This, in this case, is elections, constituencies, politicians, and parties. And the edges um, are defining the relationships between them. Neo4j fits into all of this um, because it's, uh, it's one of the first uh, databases that actually store both the vertex set and the edge set as first-class citizens in the graph. In SQL, you got the vertex set for free. Um, and in document stores, you're also getting the vertex set for free. Um, but any time that you want to start talking about the edge set, you actually start having to either compute things or it just doesn't exist in, in the case of document store databases. So the power in Neo4j is that the, both of them can be queryable, both of them can have indexes against them, both of them can have properties that all be typed in, a, in any manner. So that's why we start thinking about graph theory when we start thinking about Neo4j. I want to talk to you about the theory because it tells us what we can do. Because looking back over all of the things that graph theory have studied and realized tells us what we can move on to in future. It lets us utilize the results that have come through in the graph theoretic and the graph academic sense. And it gives us all a common language to start talking about graphs with because this is a language that has been cultivated through the academic sphere for about the last 100 years. So I want to, today, talk to you about certain aspects of uh, graph theory and how they can apply to data sets. Um, I'm going to start off by running through a load of things I'm not going to talk about and hopefully show you um, very, very briefly how they might be able to be used. So um, to do this, I'm going to start thinking about a sample data set that would be very well modelled by a graph, which is uh, the British Isles and potentially, say, the rail infrastructure within the British Isles. Um, thinking about our graph, day, our graph definition again, the vertex set will be places of interest and the edge set can be places that are connected. So thinking about that in diagrammatic form, the vertex set is all of the towns that you might want to visit and the edge set is all of the connections that sit between them. So certain aspects of graph theory that I want to talk about. Planarity. A planar graph is one that can be drawn on paper without any of its edges crossing. There are easy theories that tell you when a graph is planar, and we can work out very quickly by looking at a graph, is this planar or not? Can we draw it without the edges crossing? And when we're thinking about the British Isles, when we're thinking about rail infrastructure, then this might be useful if we're constructing roads or railways. We obviously don't want railways to cross, or if we do want railways to cross, we, need, we, we actually need to build the infrastructure, the bridges, to make sure that can happen. So having a way, by using the theories that have been developed to work out whether a graph is planar, we can answer these questions about our graph data set very quickly. We can use existing uh, results. A graph is connected if there is a path between any two points. That is, there's not two separate bits, one over here and one over here. Um, and that's a kind of useful concept to know, is because we want to be able to get to ev from one place to any other on our imaginary railway system. A more useful metric, perhaps, or a more complicated one, is a graph is k-connected. If I can remove k vertices, any k vertices of my choice, and have the graph still be connected. So this is the sort of thing that if, say, one of the stations had to close down, if Oxford Station still had to, if had to shut down because of an uh, infrastructure issue, because of a terrorist threat or something like that, then we want to make sure we can still get everywhere in our graph. And so this sort of idea of k-connectivity is useful in uh, robustness studies when we're making sure that we can get from one place to another. And spanning trees. A tree is a graph with no loops. That is, I can, it just kind of, like a kind of tree, it's got a trunk and has branches going all the way through it. Um, you can't, there's no idea of in, in a tree a branch rejoining another branch and nutrients flowing around that in a circle. Um, the similar concept is true in graph theory, and a spanning tree is a subgraph of a particular graph which is a tree but also has every single vertex connected to that tree. So this will be useful um, in, to make sure the resources flow through a network. So if you have got, say, a water system where it is very, very cheap to pump water out across the pipes that you build, but it's relatively expensive to build the pipes in the first place, then you want to make sure that you're building the minimum spanning tree to make sure water gets everywhere in your system. And this way, again, it's a thing we're going to keep coming back to. 
academic results have been developed to make finding the spanning tree very easy. There are very, very cheap, very efficient, and very well researched and documented um, ways of utilizing spanning trees and finding spanning trees in the network. So if you take your graphical model, if you take your vertex on your edge set, and if you kind of ask yourself, when you start working out the questions that you're asking yourself about your network, if you notice that you're asking yourself a question that has already been answered time and time again in graph theory, then you can start looking into the responses that have already been out there, rather than re-implementing it. And because of that, you get performance boosts, because you can start using more, more efficient algorithms. It's possible that somebody has already made a framework that will do the heavy lifting for you. And this is all kind of things that we strive for in software. Um, that was all the things I didn't want to talk about. I spent a surprising amount of time on them, so I'm just going to try and um, talk about in more detail about two particular use cases or two particular aspects of graph theory which I find interesting. Um, the first of which is colouring. Um, I'll give you a secret about mathematicians. We like the simple things in life. Um, the amount of times I've heard answers to, bana to banal answers to interview questions along the lines of, oh, I wanted to become a mathematician, a programmer, because, oh, I like to take complicated domains and make them simple. Nobody ever answers the opposite. Nobody says, oh, I wanted to get into maths, into programming, so I can make the most complicated system I ever possibly could. We, as mathematicians, as modelers, we like to make things nice and easy for ourselves. Um, and one of the simplest things in life, go, cast your mind back to school, age four, is colouring things in. Mathematicians like colouring things in. And graphs is no exception. We like to take a graph, we like to colour in parts of a graph. In order for, to make it have actual relevance to the world, we, uh, we just add one simple rule, and that is if we take a graph with our vertices and our edges, we need to assign every vertex a colour, but the rule is that no two vertices that are next to each other can have the same colour. And if we follow these rules, we can actually get a surprisingly deep um, understanding of certain problems that we're using our graph to model. So what sort of things can we solve? A particularly interesting one is uh, the organisation of sports tournaments. So how would we model that in a graph? Well, we, our vertex set will be all the matches in our sports tournament that have to be played. And then for this example, I'm, trying to, I'm thinking of tournaments that the structure of which is decided up front, say so something like the Premier League, something like the Six Nations. And the edges, edge set is, uh, sorry, two vertices are connected if at least one team is in common between those two matches. And if we colour our graph in the way that we suggested, such that no two vertices can have the same colour if they're connected, then what we get is that if two vertices are the same colour, then they can be played simultaneously. If they're the same colour, then they can't have any teams in common. And so because of that, we can then play all of our matches with the same colour teams on the same day. So if we take this, this is a graph of the Six Nations tournament. Uh, the blue nodes represent the uh, countries that play in the, uh, in the Six Nations, and every team plays against every other team over the course of the competition, then by following the colouring rules, we can colour our nodes in like this. So each of these different colours, all of the red games can be played at the same time because they do not share any matches, sorry, they do not share any teams in common, and again, all of the yellow teams and, and so on. And for a case like this where we've got six teams and they're all playing each other, potentially this is a, a very easy uh, case a very simple case, but we can actually extend this into more complicated cases where not every team plays each other team, so in a Swiss tournament for a round robin, or where we've got large numbers of teams where actually it's easier just to throw something into a, uh, into a uh, computational programmatic organiser than having to do it all by hand. There are other uses for graph colouring algorithms, mobile phone tower frequency assignments. If the uh, so if you have a large number of mobile phone towers across your country, if you put two mobile phone towers very close to each other, if they're using the same frequency of signal, then the frequencies will interact badly and you'll get interference on the line. And so what you find is that mobile phones within a certain radius of each other have to be assigned different frequencies to stop this, uh, to stop this interference from happening. If you take the radius for each of these towers, and if you connect... Uh, two towers, so nodes representing two towers on the graph, if they are within this radius of each other, then you will find that by colouring the graph, you will find out the minimum number of frequencies that you need to assign in order to have a low interference graph. Solving Sudoku's can be done using Neo4j. If you take V, the vertex set as being the numbers of squares on the graph, 
if you draw edges in such a way that um, two squares are connected, if you know that they are going to have different numbers, or know that they must have different numbers in, then if you colour the graph in, you will be able to solve that Sudoku. Um, I'm aware that I'm not telling you how you can colour the graph in. Um, it is still to get a perfect colouring, I think, MP complete. Uh, but there are algorithms out there that do um, either non-deterministically give you very, very good response rates, or if you're using deterministic graphs, there are certain subsets of graphs that, um, that will have very, very efficient algorithms about them. Similarly, uh, there's, been a, there's a great talk on the NEO website about how you can avoid deadlocks within your Java application um, by using graph colouring, essentially by um, modelling all of the processes that you need to use as vertices, by making sure, by, by putting edges between them if they need to use some of the same resources, and then by colouring them in, you can work out which processes in your, in your uh, application can be run at the same time. If you wanted, if you kind of are thinking there, going, ah, I've got a graph model, and uh, there's a problem that I could solve using graph colouring, you might be thinking, how can I, um, how can I implement the colouring algorithms? How can I make it fast? The answer is that there's no Java framework, but there's a keyword yet. So please, this is my call to arms. Please, somebody make a good Java graph colouring framework. I'm aware that there's a graph aware board out there that says, ah put something down here if you've got an idea and my planets to attack that during my lunch break and add a graph colouring on there. Because it does, it is something that you find yourself using time and time again. The other thing that I wanted to talk about um, is random graphs. I've raised the word random, I've raised words like non-determinism in meetings with our clients a few times and the looks on their faces, they just plummet. Randomness is scary. Everybody thinks, as soon as you hear the word random in a software development project, everybody thinks it is a uh, a genuinely terrifying concept, and it can be. There are some applications for which you do not want your randomness. There are, if you are making a stock trading application, if you started using non-determinism, I would be terrified and, and be afraid of the state of the economic status of our country. Um, it, it's a complicated topic. Somebody should do a talk about that. I have. The link is there. I'll send the slides around on Twitter afterwards if you want to start looking into non-deterministic algorithms. But today, I'm going to assume that all of you want to use randomness in your applications because I don't want to have to convince you of that. When we say a random graph, we don't just mean any graph that you can pluck out of thin air. Um, in order to make it useful to model um, things that we might want to model, then we, it's useful often to think about a graph which has a fixed number of vertices so that, or a fixed number of nodes, and then the edges of which are generated non-deterministically in a certain non-deterministic manner. Random graphs definitely have use cases, um, and I'll try and cover a few of them today. Um, first of all, stubbing your test data. There's a couple of kind of different kinds of tests that you might want to do. If you want to load a performance test your application and you want to do it against a database, but you don't want to bring the database down by soak testing your application, say, then you might want to just very, very quickly spin up a random database that you can use. Um, if you want to write a unit test um, that, doesn't, that isn't dependent on some kind of hard-coded data that you've put in and therefore dependent on implementation detail, then again, you might want to use random data. So if we have a method that colours graphs, hint, hint, if you have a method that colours the vertices of a graph in a particular way, you might start thinking about how to test that. You start off with your stub data set. Typically, in old tests, in the arrange act assert method, you would write this, uh, you would write the data yourself. You would then apply your method to it, and then you would assert certain things about it. And to avoid having to assert that, say, to, to avoid your test breaking, if you replace the colour red in your method with the colour blue, then you might want to assert general rules about your application or about your graph, rather than very specific shapes of the data at the end. So you might want to assert that every node has a colour, and you might want to assert that no two adjacent nodes share a colour. And then once you've written your test like this, you can see it's very easy to take out your hard-coded stub data set and replace a randomly generated data set. And the advantage that you get of this is that actually if your application works for the exact test graph that you write up front, but doesn't work for half the other graphs out there, then you'll find this very, very easily. I know many people particularly like um, graphs that... Uh, I know people like graphs... Sorry, I know people like tests that uh, are deterministic, so you can see exactly what, um, what's gone wrong. But there's a limit behind uh, writing deterministic tests in that you don't actually get to test every single case. 
Um, and the other use case is for simulation algorithms. So simulation, what we mean by that is running a random thing lots and lots of times and then taking some kind of aggregate of the collective results. Um, NASDAQ has got a great definition. Um, why might you want to sim simulate something? Well, firstly, you might want to simulate it to model underlying randomness. The bookmakers who are making odds for this general election are probably running hundreds and thousands and billions of simu simulations of the election result. And that's how, they're, they're how many times the SNP are coming out with 50 seats, say, um, is what's going into factor, it was what's going to factor into their odds. You might also use simulation if you've got an underlying question that's very hard or difficult to answer. So non-deterministic algorithms are very often used when you've got MP-complete problems. Or in which you, uh, you might want to use simulation in which you're trying to model something which you don't have full knowledge of. Either because the information just isn't out there in the first place, or because you're trying to model something that's just too big to have in a single database. Um, it's possible to use non-determinism and always be correct. It's a very good book, Probabilistic Combinatorics, if you are that way inclined. Um, it's very mathematically heavy, very dense. But it's, uh, it's worth pointing out that sometimes by running queries against typical graphs, you actually solve problems for all graphs. How do we accomplish um, random graph modeling in the A4J? Well, in theory, you could do it yourself. Um, this is a sample method that would let you do so. You just um, start, you just set an initial config of two vertices which are connected, and then you incrementally add a vertex and randomly connect it to any other vertex. But in practice, there are great frameworks out there that will do this for you, and GraphAware is uh, one that contains uh, random graph generators. GraphAware, if you're not, uh, I don't work for GraphAware, but they do market themselves as the number one Neo4j consultancy. Um, I don't know how true that is. Uh, I'm not big on the Neo4j consulting scene. Um, but they have open sourced a lot of projects under the GPL licensing, so please go and use them um, if you think you're going to be using graphs in your project. Um, in particular, I want to draw attention to the fact that they've got graph generators, which will generate your random graphs for you so you don't have to write the code yourself. And one more thing I want to draw attention to is at the bottom here. This list here, provided implementations of graph generators include uh, Erdős Renyi models, Barabézi Albert models, etc. So what we mean by this, what we mean by the different ways of generating these graphs, if we go back to our definition, a graph of a fixed number of vertices which are generated non-deterministically, what we mean is that it's the method of determining how your non-deterministic edges are determined. Essentially, how do you put the edges onto your graph? Erdős Renyi is a very simple algorithm. It's a very easy one. You take your n vertices and then you randomly connect them uh, so that, such that every node has got a uniform probability distribution, such that every node is equally likely to be as connected to every other node. These are sample, sample generated graphs for p being 0.2, a half, and 0.8 respectively. And so you're going to get kind of sparsely connected graphs and densely connected graphs. There is a problem with this model, and that is that it actually doesn't model very many real-world scenarios very well, because in the real world, not every node is created equally. So if I want to model data about film actors, then prolific actors like Kevin Bacon have got far more connections than random drama student number 1728, who has appeared in exactly one movie and had his career bomb. Um, and also for data such as the spread of HIV AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa. If the vertex set is the population of sub-Saharan Africa and edges represent sexual contact between two people with a risk of infection, then looking at that, you find that um, the number of people, it is, it's not randomly distributed, not, people don't have sexual contact with the same number of people. You get small numbers of people with large degrees of contact and low numbers of people, sorry, yeah, and large numbers of people with a very low degree of contact. And studying this kind of data set is very interesting because it gives you genuine real world use cases for this. Because what you find is that you don't just give out preventative treatment, potentially expensive preventative treatment to everybody, but you use these kinds of simulations where you can't know the full data set because people are not going to divulge that information to you. And you can, if you can identify these small numbers of highly connected nodes, then if you target treatment around those areas, then all of a sudden you have just made a much bigger difference for a much smaller cost. The two data sets I've talked about already, Kevin Bacon and the spread of HIV, are actually um, both around the same shape. They're both scale-free networks, which essentially, as I said, means that you've got a small number of highly connected hubs, 
and a large number of sparsely connected nodes. Um, and this is a kind of the hubs in these cases act as, say, blockbuster stars uh, or patriarchs in, uh, in sub Saharan Africa versus um, the, the much more common sparse nodes. And if you plot the graph of, so this is, uh, if you plot the chart of degree of connectivity on uh, one axis and the frequency of uh, people with that, or nodes with that connectivity, you'll find that all of these scale free networks taper according to a power law. This is what the Barabasi Albert graph simulation model uh, intends to do. So in this one, if you, you incrementally add your nodes again, that it's much more likely for a one particular node to be connected to, um, to one that's already got a high degree of connectivity. And you'll find that your graphs start, um, start looking like this, um, where once one node is particularly connected, it's much more likely to get itself connected. The use case of something like this in a modern software application, if you're not doing academic simulation, is, um, is say, for example, if you're load testing, if you load test against an Erdős-Renyi model, then you might find that um, you get false positives or you get false security in the ability of your graph or your program to deal with particular graphs. Because it might be that you're getting approximately equal nodes everywhere and your program can deal with them, but it can't deal with the potential for very, very highly connected nodes. So when you're starting to load test your application, try and make sure you're load testing against a stub data set that does represent the shape of your data. Um, we've gone through a lot of theory, and if uh, you remember, I promised you something at the beginning of the talk. Um, this data set, this shape of data is actually exactly the same as the uh, data about the internet. So if you plot the number of, so if you uh, model the internet as a graph, if your vertex set are websites, and if your edge set are links between the two websites, then you will find that it follows exactly the same power law distribution. A very, very large number of sites with one link, which is probably from Google back to you, um, such as my, uh, my GeoCities account back when I was 11 years old, um, and you'll get a, lot, a, a large amount of, sorry, you'll get a very small amount of very, very highly connected nodes. So that's the search engines of the world. That's the advertising hubs, whose job it is purely to um, kind of act as a, as a hub in the hub and spoke advertising model. So if I want you to take one thing from this talk, looking at graph theory can give us a common language. It can actually let us utilize the, uh, the results that have come in the past. Because utilizing the techniques means that we don't have to actually solve problems from scratch each time. We can look back over the, the theory that has already been developed, the algorithms that have been developed, and the frameworks that have been developed, and use them in our programs. And the internet does look like Kevin Bacon's career. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to be around during the day, so please come and grab me if you have any more questions. Thank you.